This is my Atari 65 XE. There are many like it, but this one is mine. Released in 1985, it was mainly a repurposing of previous Atari 8-bit technologies. And being announced at the same time as the 16-bit 520ST, the styling influence of its 16-bit successor is obvious. We previously repaired this machine when it lost its colour, but I'd like to give it a proper test. So we're going to build this simple Super Salt Diagnostic cartridge. It's not a difficult build, so we should be able to do it pretty quickly. Then we can give it a proper workout. And we're going to do it right now. Mark fixes stuff. This channel is sponsored by PCBWay, and they don't just do PCBs. If you want professional 3D printing, just upload your models, pick from a variety of materials and colors, and you're on your PCBWay. Thanks to Elaine and the PCBWay team for supporting Mark Fix's stuff. Basically, the Super Salt is a cartridge diagnostic tool from back in the day. This handy dandy board by C64 Istanbul will allow us to burn that ROM to a variety of EEPROM sizes. There's only three pieces of hardware, and you don't even need two of those if you go for an 8K EEPROM. We'll be using a 28-pin wide dip socket. If you've got better eyes than me, then you don't need to count the pins because the number is actually embossed on these sockets. The smallest EEPROMs I can find at the moment are these 27C256 EEPROMs. The 256 in the part name here means kilobits, and when you convert that to kilobytes, it gives us 32 kilobytes of data capacity. The next component on the board is a 100 nanofarad capacitor. You can pick these up anywhere. They're usually marked with 104. And the last component we need is a 74LS00. I'm going to pop this into a socket as well because although it's only worth about 30 pence, everybody moans at me when I don't socket them. And I can't stand the moaning. I just can't. The 74LS00 itself is a quad 2 input NAND gate. Each of the four NAND gates internally has two inputs and one output, with the output being derived by the value of the two inputs at each gate. Did that make sense? Look, should we just build the thing? We'll be using my fakey fakey please don't break EEPROM programmer, which I modified and I still haven't put back together. Sorry, I really should do that. We can use it to test the vectors on our 74LS00. And then of course we'll use it to program our EEPROM. Over to my ridiculously wobbly PCB holder. I'm going to talk less so you can enjoy the mellow sights of some simple soldering. It makes sense to solder the capacitor first because the sockets will be higher than it when we're finished. And we don't want them to get in the way. There's no polarity at play here, so you can slip your part in however you like. Once your part's in place, splay the legs so that your part doesn't drop out whilst you're soldering. Perfect. With our component in place, it's time to get our tools ready. Let's get our fume extractor extracting. and our soldering iron ready to rock and roll. We'll just leave it set at its usual heat of 330 degrees centigrade. It's a good catch-all temperature for me. And I'm sorry to say I won't be using unleaded solder today. I would, but I can't find it. The amount we're using will be fairly inconsequential anyway, and it's not like I'm selling this cartridge. So let's get down to soldering. And I know you all love an extreme close-up, so I've swapped lens to bring you this one. Heating the pad and the component leg at the same time, we apply the solder. Then we clip off the leads. These side cutters actually have a retaining arm which stops the leads flying off and blinding passers by. A very good thing indeed. Okay, so that's our capacitor installed. 
Now that's in, we can pop the sockets on. We'll start with the big one. Like a glove. And to hold it in place, we'll use some of this Kapton tape. It's a good alternative to Smurf poo when the Smurfs just aren't producing. The nice thing about Kapton tape is it's heat resistant and it's easy to remove, so it doesn't melt and it doesn't get stuck to the board forever. The best approach is to solder the four opposing pins first. This ensures your socket can't drop out whilst you're soldering, which happens quite a lot if you don't take this very basic set of precautions. At this point, the fume extractor is really paying for itself. Why don't we have another one of our extreme close-ups? And that's enough lazing about. For the rest of the pins, I think we'll speed it up a touch. Soldering sockets is quite forgiving, so you can go back for the occasional double dab if you don't feel like the solder has taken. Our socket's soldered, so let's peel off our polyamide tape. If you are only using an 8kb EEPROM 27C64, you don't need to put the next component on the board. But we're going to be using one that's a bit larger, so we need it. I'm going to reuse the same piece of polyamide tape. Frugal. Mmm. And of course, the first thing we're going to solder are the four corners, not the four candles, or andles for forks. Got any O's? I really do need to replace my PCB holder because this one wobbles a lot. You'll see the occasional wobble, but I've had to edit out quite a lot of wobbly footage. I've not done a poll, but I don't think anybody wants to watch my wobbly bits. In fact, is anyone even interested in taking my poll? Sorry to linger on this shot, but I just love the way that the flux on the board reacts as it's cooling down. I hope you're enjoying this video. If you are, then perhaps you consider becoming a patron of my channel. You'll get ad-free early access to all my videos and some other perks. If this interests you, come along to patreon.com forward slash markfixes stuff. Hope to see you there. The board is complete. That didn't take long at all, did it? Now it's time to do some EEPROM programming. Let's take the lid off though, because it gets in the way. And make sure my switch is in the off position. We don't want an additional seven volts going into the chip. First, we're going to test our logic. To test my logic, I just go to device, logic IC select, and there is a huge list of devices here. I mean, it really is massive. The list I mean. Down in the bottom of the software, we've got the vector table. This shows the possible inputs and outputs. Up the top, we've got the definitions that are shown in the vector table, so we know what we're looking at. Now you can press this also find button which will fire off some states to the chip in your programmer and come back with a list of possible candidates for what it is. And it does find what we want, it's the 7400, but it's useless because you can't click into that and then you have to go and pick it out of the list anyway. I suppose maybe if you had an unmarked chip that might be helpful. We've selected our device, we can see what lines what, and now we press test and instantaneously we can see that all vector testing is normal. This chip is good and I'm happy with that. That can go into our cart. Sorry, Dave. Let's liberate our silicon storage from its luxurious packing. 
I've actually changed my mind and I think we'll use the Hitachi chip because it's a bit cleaner than the others. That PGM 12.5V is the programming voltage that we'll need. Remember that for later. Popping our EEPROM into the burner in the right orientation, let's go over to the computer. And yes, the 7 volt boost switch is still off. I really should tidy that up and label it. Sorry Dave. OK, so I'm going to get a bit down and dirty now. Hold on to your hats, fixers. This is a general EEPROM type, a 27C256. We know it's a Hitachi part. So popping the relevant numbers in and selecting Hitachi, we see that we've got a list. We know that our package is DIP28, SOP28 being surface mount, and I think I remember a G being in the EEPROM name somewhere, so this will probably do. I've bought enough EEPROMs that have been given a new identity by AliExpress sellers that I've learned to take what's written on the EEPROM with a pinch of salt. But clicking into the Device Info tab confirms what we think we've selected. We just need to make sure that our programming voltage is set to 12.5 volts. Everything else can stay as default. Next we need to load our data into the EEPROM programming software. The EEPROM needs to be completely full, so if the data isn't big enough for the EEPROM you're using, you'll need to duplicate it to fill that EEPROM. Someone's already done this for us and labelled it as the 27C256 version. That's really handy, so thanks to whoever did that. With our data loaded into the buffer of the program, you should be able to scroll down and find some human readable text. And we do find it, and that's an excellent sign. So, all we need to do now is to program our EEPROM. And it's really easy. You just press the programming button up the top and then click program in the window that appears. But oh no, there's a problem. We've got a check ID error. Our physical EEPROM ID doesn't match the ID of the device we selected in the software. So we'll just disable ID checking. I'm fairly confident that this will program the device perfectly well. With ID checking disabled, we press program once again. And programming starts. Disabling the device ID is something you'll often need to do with remarked chips. I do, however, always ensure that verify after is checked because that will read the data back and compare it against the software buffer once it's all done. And speaking of done, our EEPROM is programmed and verified. It's time to install our EEPROM and logic chip into our cartridge board. Whilst I do a gratuitous pan of the project, please take a moment to hit subscribe to the channel. We'll pop our logic in first, making sure the notch on the chip lines up with the notch on the socket. Then it's the EEPROM's turn, and the same rules apply. Make sure the notches line up. Looking at the sides of our cartridge, we make sure that the chip legs are actually in the sockets and not hanging out, because nobody wants an extra leg hanging out. Now I know what you're thinking. Mark, you scream. You should have a label on that EEPROM. I'll do it later. I said I'll do it later. For now, it's testing time. Before I do that though, I'm a bit ashamed at the amount of muck on my keyboard, so I thought I'd give it a quick brush and a quick hoover to get rid of some of the dust. I actually cleaned this computer not long ago, so it must be surface stuff and it has been on display on my shelf. So in the end, it comes up quite nicely. Okay, time to test for real, and we're going to use this Retro Computer Shack cable. If you need a cable, go to Retro Computer Shack. Ian's amazing. We're also going to plug in my old school power supply. It's not let me down. Now, this is the cartridge port. Now, looking at the cartridge that we made, you would be forgiven for thinking that you need to take your cartridge and shove it in like this. Right? Wrong. It's actually the wrong way around. These cartridges go with the chips on the bottom. Like this. You probably won't blow your Atari up if you put it in the wrong way around, but it makes you look very, very silly indeed. 
let's power on my ugly but free LCD TV and at least it's 4-3 ratio. Then turn on our Atari and uh, hooray! Oh, <laughs> made me worry there. There are a few versions of the SuperSalt cartridge. I tend to use the CPS SuperSalt because, well, it's the one I always use and I'm used to it. We can't use everything in the cartridge because some routines need additional hardware. For example, the two-way clock test. Well, that needs the external port box. We don't have it, so we can't do that test, but there are quite a lot that we can do, and here's a couple of them. In the individual test menu, the first character of the line selects that test. So for example, for joystick test, you would press J. Then you can have all the fun in the world waggling your joystick and flicking your button to your heart's content. Flick. You can test your GTIA chip, which is jolly important for games because it determines where your character goes on the screen. And of course, you can check the sound produced by your Atari. There's also a keyboard test, a ROM test, a RAM test. There's a color bar test and a grayscale bar test. It's pretty handy. Well, that's that. A big thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. What do you think of the Super Salt cartridge? Big thanks to my amazing patrons appearing on the screen right now. Look at them, they're gorgeous. You can become one of them by visiting patreon.com forward slash markfixes stuff. You'll get ad free early access, some behind the scenes videos, access to the patron discord, and you'll become instantly able to do the moonwalk. That's right, instantly. That might not actually be true. Thanks for watching. Hey, I've got an idea. Why don't you go and watch one of these other videos? Left or right, it doesn't matter. Oh, make sure you're subscribed as well. See ya. Bye.